then you could also do a clap. Oh yeah. Well, why don't you do it since you're the expert at clapping? So you warm up your hands like this. You really don't need to do this part. That's how you it's clap. loud. Well, that's how you clap. No, okay, don't do this. At the end, you need to end up like this, but just not straight. Okay. It needs to be relaxed. Ow. It's better, but you're still doing this. That's why you're getting this. You need that. Hi everyone, I already posted a spoiler-free review of A Desolation Called Peace by Arkady Martin, and I didn't have my copy of the book yet because I read it on ebook as an ARC, so here is the cover. You all now know I actually own this book. Uh, I had actually pre-ordered it before I got the ARC. So my husband actually finished reading the book two days ago, I think, and he had also recently read A Memory Called Empire. So. It's a really interesting book, and I thought, even though I did a spoiler-free review already, it would be fun if we got a chance to talk about it. Because when we did his, I think it was your January wrap-up video, because you read so much in January, a lot of commenters said they liked seeing us talk about the books that we had both read recently. So yeah, I thought that would be a fun thing to do. We don't really have a plan. I have some notes on my phone in case, you know, we run out of ideas to talk about, even though we've been talking about this book for the past few days. I'm going to make you hold this so I can hold the phone. So. Voila. <laughs> All right, so. Wow, well, I can't. Well, what, I, what and, this I is gonna be, and this is going to be a spoiler. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, this video is going to have spoilers for both A Memory Called Empire and A Desolation Called Peace. We will be freely discussing anything in both books. So if you have not read A Desolation Called Peace or have not read A Memory Called Empire and you don't want to get spoiled, this is probably not the video for you. Oh, this is the wrong, that's the wrong <laughs> notes. That's why I looked at this and it didn't make sense. That was my notes for the spoiler-free review. Cool. So how did you like this compared to A Memory Called Empire? I really loved both books. Uh, I ended up rating them a five for me. They are so well written and the, the language is so beautiful and evocative in both of them. I definitely thought though that A Memory Called Empire is a little tighter in terms of how it's written. It's just flows a little bit better in terms of, I don't know, it just feels like a fantastic first book in a series. It's exactly what you want. Uh, a Desolation Called Peace, it's just more broad and we get more viewpoints, it seems like, and it's just not as tight, but that's not a bad thing. I think it's just a character of the book and part of what makes it great. So do you feel like you enjoyed them both equally? About, yeah. It, it's again, they're just slightly different. So it's hard to do a direct comparison, actually, which is kind of funny since they're in the same series. I feel like I had this thing, though. I enjoyed A Memory Called Empire so much more the second time I read it, and I'm kind of expecting to have that with this one as well. I could definitely see I mean, that. I know you haven't reread. You just finished A Memory Called Empire pretty recently. Yeah, I, I only read each of these once. But I could see that, especially since I know you read A Desolation Called Peace in like one sitting. I did, so. yeah. And you got to read it over a few days anyway. Yeah. So I read slower. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I've seen you finish things quickly, but you just had more of a chance to like sit with it and everything. So honestly, probably you'll remember details better than me right now. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I, I agree with what you said about A Memory Called Empire. It felt like there was really one one specific plot and a desolation called peace while there were still stakes it just wasn't as immediate which is kind of funny because you'd think like the threat of like alien invasion and all-out war would feel like stakes but to me it didn't feel like as much stakes compared to Mahi just trying to figure out what the heck is going on and not die and save Lizelle Station. Yeah, there seemed to be even more, well, I think it's because of the breadth of it. It's covering, you know, the, the known galaxy of Texcalon and right up to the border. So it feels like all the threads that are coming together um, are just more distant. And I think that in the first book, even though you did get multiple threads and different people and their agendas, and we had a lot of that, but it was all within the city. So it just felt more contained. Yeah, it was all all sort of going on around this succession crisis almost, right? Yeah, exactly. And here it's, what are we going to do with these aliens? And 
I think actually a, a good thing that Arcadia Martin did was we do get a feeling for the distance because there's so much time lag between the different parties and their agendas, but it was just uh, spaced out really well in the book. Not that it felt like we were getting fed it in, in a timed way, but just acknowledging the fact that there is a lot of distance and creating that distance also in the writing. But also the stakes, you had different stakes for different characters. Absolutely. And the first book is because Memory Called Empire only has Mahit's point of view and we have four, three, four point of view characters in this book and they all have slightly different stakes and slightly different interests. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's it was really interesting to see how it came together in the end. Uh, one of the things that we had talked about actually right after I finished it, even before I finished it, was how layered this idea of memory and integrated memory and the idea of what a person is or what a people are or what us, I, we, all of that is. Um, it just, there, there are so many more layers of that in a desolation called peace, which was really cool because you get all these nuances. I, I feel like in a memory called empire, it was basically, uh, LaSalle has this new, new to Texcalon has this this technology of you are part of a line of people that came before you and you have their memories and Texcaloni people are very anti, you know, helping your brain with that sort of thing. And then here we're confronted with an enemy that is not just that, but is just one organism that's made up of multiple parts that think in one way. And so I, I, to me, I had thought, oh, okay, we're just going to kind of have that. That's the main thing that we're going to have. But in the end, it was really layered because we got to know a little bit more about the sunlit. We got to know about the shards and how they're connected and how that's almost closer to the enemy than even LaSalle is. And by the end, this was kind of funny, but in a way, LaSalle's technology is practically obsolete in comparison to the enemy. Yeah. I feel like it was a really interesting example of how you could take an idea and really explore it in the first book and then actually like build on it so much that really, I didn't know what to expect from this book, but I actually wasn't expecting to have that same idea of like these different kinds of consciousness be expanded on so much. And I was also kind of thinking while you were talking about it of like why the text colon would be so against that kind of neurological enhancement and why I think it's because their high culture is so into like poetry and self-expression and basically the way you show your like the in crowd is by knowing all this stuff and having all this education. I mean, do you think that's right? Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's sort of a gatekeeper for them yeah. in, in many ways. But I think the other thing that we both found interesting was to see how many different people are considered tex Lim. Why you said that. I think I, I got that. I've never tried to say that out loud. I mean, I did hear it in the oh, audio book, so it's a little... Texacolanitzlim? Something like that. But yeah, we, we see Nine Hibiscus, and we see um, Swarm. I forgot his name. So, no. Something Cicada? Tw 20 Cicada, 20 thank cicada. you. And they're both from, you know, not the city. It's not like Three Seagrass that like was born in Texcalon as a Texcalon meets Slim. Um, these are peoples that were conquered and are part of the empire, but are citizens and, and are really part of the empire. But I think they were conquered at some point in the past, right? Like they were yes. still born citizens. Absolutely. And raised as citizens. But to sort of see them and how they're integrated and then to see Mahit, who in many ways is more Tescalani than like a lot of people, but she still doesn't feel it and still is considered a barbarian. Um, and we were kind of talking about it, like she had the option of becoming a citizen and she just chose not to. So it's kind of interesting to see that juxtaposition and realize that a lot of what she is feeling is really hers alone and not really a true reflection of the empire. One of the things that, I don't know if this really had a place in my spoiler-free review, but either way, I forgot to talk about it. The moment when you see her going back to her native country, basically, to the station. And she is just, like, so not connected to the culture there, especially the youth 
culture where even she's probably not that I'm guessing she's maybe a little younger than us right she's probably mm -hmm. somewhere in her 20s and then she has the Imago Iskander who is you know 25 years older than that basically and she's seeing the youth culture and being like she doesn't even know what's cool she doesn't really connect to it and I feel like we've all kind of felt that way sometimes we were like man I don't even know what kids these days like like I don't know what 18 year olds like I she kind of felt old and Iskander felt even older and but also just that feeling like she, you see, when you see her in her home environment, and she really doesn't feel like she fits in there either. So it was, again, I wasn't sure where we were going to go with her character in this book. And I honestly, I think in some ways I was more interested in all of the other points of view. But I mean, I still enjoyed her progression as a character in this book. I just kind of felt like it was more just the, the culmination of everything that happened in the first book rather than like a new arc for her. Right. What was your favorite point of view? Um, Probably eight. Either Three Seagrass or Eight Antidote. I know I keep saying Eight Antidote was my favorite character, and I think it's because I just thought he was so interesting as a, you know, a child point of view where he's both, he does very much seem like an 11-year-old kid, but he's also very jaded and very smart, and also just, just on the cusp of seeing the world like an adult, but not quite. Yeah, I agree. I think he was definitely my favorite as well. I think Nine Hibiscus was, was very interesting as well, but... I, I liked his point of view the most. There was something about Nine Hibiscus, even though I really liked the character. Actually, I really liked her point of view, but somehow I didn't feel like the same connection with other characters. It's like, you, for example, you saw Three Seagrass from Mahit's point of view for the whole first book, so you feel kind of connected to her when you see her again, but I also, I talked about this in my other video, I really felt like the way she was to others and then the way you sort of see her from her own point of view, it really felt like the same person, and I was kind of missing that with Nine Hibiscus. Yeah, that's true. She was definitely more your typical character that the way other people perceive her is different than how she perceives herself in some ways or how she thinks inside her head. So yeah, I felt like in some ways she felt like a character who was kind of misunderstood by everyone around her to some extent in terms of her motives or intentions or, you know, what she's up to. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I, you know, what was interesting to me is I would have loved to learn more about 20 Cicada and his whole culture. Like that seems really interesting. I feel like the fact that Arcadia and Martine gives us a really strong relationship between those two characters, between Nine Hibiscus and Twenty Cicada, that kind of makes up for the fact that we don't get to know either of them that well, right? Like when yeah. you see people, when you see characters like with their friends or with people they're close to, it's kind of, uh, it tells you something about who they are. Yeah, it gave us a lot of our information came from that relationship and how they are together. But I would think, I think there could be like another book about Nine Hibiscus that would be really interesting. Absolutely. I just, I guess what I'm responding to is I don't feel like the other characters got to know her particularly. No, no one really got to know her. But I really liked, I mean, just her role as sort of a newly made, how do they pronounce that? Yautlik. Yautlik. That's how it was in the audiobook? Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought the way the balance of power was handled in this book was super interesting. It really reminded me of what I know about the Roman Empire, where the military, it's like, it seems like any time the empire, the emperor makes one of these Yautleks, like makes a a top military commander, there's always this danger of this person having too much loyalty of the military and becoming too independent and too powerful. Yeah, but on the other hand, we see 19 ads basically advocating for Nine Hibiscus and basically saying, like, this loyalty is what is great about Nine Hibiscus, that she can get the loyalty of her people. This being despite that there was just an attempted... <laughs> Uh, a coup, which is, it's actually pretty incredible for the new emperor to feel that comfortable with that. But I don't think it's that she feels so comfortable. I think it's that she knows she needs to play that game. Yeah. That, that's, right. like, that's how I read it. Like, I didn't read it as that she's any great idealist about human nature. I mean, the 19 ads is not particularly idealistic about people being good or anything like that or noble. It's just that the job of the emperor is to balance all of these different interests and different powers. I agree. I think it was also, she felt that hopefully Nine Hibiscus would be the best person for this job. Yeah. Knowing what was, with the limited information that they currently had, this was someone that would think outside the box, would not need to check in, and would still be able to get things done. So just jumping to another thing now, since you listened to A Memory Called Empire on audiobook and you read A Desolation Called Peace physically, how do you feel about both those reading experiences? Like, do you have a favorite? I really enjoyed both. The audiobook is fantastic. Um, 
I think that this happens to me a lot of the times with audiobooks. I don't end up knowing how things are spelled, especially names. I mean, that's fair. But this one surprised me more than most. So it was it was really interesting, actually, to get to read the book. It took me just a few pages, and then it was super comfortable to be reading A Desolation Called Peace rather than listening to it. I would recommend both because the audiobook is actually really fantastic. So you would say if you're already an audiobook listener, listen on audiobook, and if you, but you don't like have to listen to the audiobook. Yeah, you really don't. It was very comfortable to be reading it, and I felt just as drawn into it, especially once we got to eh, probably again like a third of the way through the book. Like it takes some time to get truly into it, and then I couldn't put it down. Yeah, you were books. you were pretty hooked towards the end. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you interrupted me. <laughs> I was filming my vlog for the great hunt and I kept interrupting you and Yeah, I don't think it was it made it onto the vlog, but uh, I don't know. I haven't edited that yet. No, but I think we weren't recording, but oh, I was at okay. like 95% or something when she interrupted me. I think me. I did film at least a little of you <laughs> being annoyed that I We'll see. I have to I have to edit that soon. Yeah. Maybe by the time I post, I don't know if I'm going to post that either before or after I do this video. So, yeah. you know, if you're a Wheel of Time fan, stay tuned. <laughs> Just because this kind of struck me recently, like a while after I finished the book even, you've read the Ender's Game series, right? Like yeah. you read Speaker for the Dead and like all the other ones. So I don't know if this is intentional or not because it's a very long time since I read that series, like high school, middle school, I don't know. But the aliens in this reminded me of the two main alien species in um, that series a lot. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that either. Because in uh, in that universe, you have the buggers. Are they going to change the name? I feel like they that? should. I feel like in the movie, I, I didn't realize it until I said it out loud, but I feel like maybe in the movie already. That was after our first date was the uh, seeing Ender's Game, the movie, which wasn't great. But it still worked because we're together. <laughs> Yay. Because I didn't get too... It was, it was just bad enough that I didn't get, like, too annoyed if you distracted me during the movie because yeah. I don't like being interrupted during movies, do I? No, not at all. <laughs> it's not very romantic. <laughs> um, anyway, what was it? Okay, so you have the aliens that are, like, the hive mind in that, but then also, and this is spoilers for the Ender's Game series, skip ahead like 15 seconds if you don't want to know this, but if you remember, I think it's in Speaker for the Dead, the piggies, the other ones, they basically go from living creatures and they turn into trees by like getting planted basically. And it really reminded me of the way in this book, the aliens are taking like individual people from, I guess, different races, although it seems like mostly one, and they put this seed or like spore in them that then makes them join the collective consciousness. And that was like kind of similar. Yeah, it is very similar. I hadn't really thought about it and it's been a long time since I've read that series and I, I didn't fully finish it because I skipped to the last book and that was a mistake. It um, gets like more and more philosophical and weirder though. I mean, I haven't read, there's so many like side series and I, I'm definitely way behind. Like I haven't read Orson Scott Card in quite a long time. But. Yeah, but there is a lot of similarities. I mean, really they they function in, in a very similar way to both of those, yeah. I mean, and that series does become kind of like philosophical science fiction about the nature of identity and consciousness, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's that. I don't know if Arkady Martin is a fan of that series or even if she'd appreciate the comparison, but it really reminded me. Okay, I've been trying to find out if there will be any more books in this series or in this universe, and I haven't found anything yet. What do you think? Like, do you think there will be more? If you had to guess. I would like there to be more. I think that it was set up about as well as A Memory Called Empire for a sequel. So it's really 50-50. I would assume that Mahit would not be as major a viewpoint going if, forward. If a viewpoint at all. Like maybe she yeah. would cameo. I feel like she would cameo. I, I feel like that too. Yeah. And I don't know where it would go. Um, I'm assuming Swarm would be more involved potentially. Uh, but it depends. It depends if there's a time skip or not or anything like that. But I would love for there to be more in this universe one way or another, even if it's like side character stuff or different stories, because the universe itself is very cool and, and how it functions. I feel like before I end the video, 
I just want to talk about like things that we liked that I couldn't talk about in this spoiler free video, like the space cats, oh, space, space kittens. I don't know. So cute. I forget what they're actually called other than cats, but. Waran. Okay, whatever. Kittens. I don't know. Usually I'm the one that remembers the names of things, but in this, I'm just making you remember. But yeah, I just thought that was, that was really cute. They showed up a couple of times. Just like little kittens that are like breeding. Are they, are they like in the air ducts? Yeah. Right? All so in the air ducts. I thought that was really cute. Um, anything, is there any anything we haven't talked about that you just liked that was in the book? That's Well, with the kittens, I actually really liked the relationship between, or I, I feel like we got to know 20 Cicada better by seeing him with the kitten and how he was. Because he like hates the kittens and then he one adopts him anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, the thing that I thought would actually become more important and funnily did not was the fact that they made a comparison between the physical body of the aliens uh, having sort of like cat-like ears. Oh. And I wasn't sure I if there was going that. to be something yeah. in there or not. And there wasn't. And yeah. there's no connection. But that was interesting to me. Oh, the, th the, the fact that the aliens, that it makes me want to puke when you hear the sounds. That was like so visceral to me. That was really cool. I actually really liked that. And it was very interesting because it didn't seem like they meant for that to be the case. It's just they don't know how to communicate anymore in this way. And it just happens to be that those vibrations are not great for humans. <laughs> but yeah, I felt like I was talking to somebody else about this recently who's not going to read the book. Um, the aliens, like they're not really good or bad. I feel like they're kind of exactly like the text Kalan. Like, are they like expanding their empire? Like, yes. They weren't like bad conquerors, but they also, they weren't good either. They yeah. just were, you know? Yeah, and for LaSalle, this is all bad news because they're <laughs> gonna get swallowed up by two peoples now. It just got really dark inside. It did. That's okay. Shut up. I think that's basically everything I had written down to talk about. Um, yeah, in general, I think we both really enjoyed these books. I think we're both really looking forward and hoping that there's more. And yeah, I, I, for me, I would love to, to know what other people thought, because I think this is some of the, both of these are some of the best books that I've read in a long time. Yeah. So if you're reading this series or if you've read A Desolation Called Peace, let us know your thoughts down in the comments, what you think of our take on it, um, any other ideas that you have. I just thought it'd be fun to do like a full discussion video like this. It's very freeing. <laughs> <laughs> Not having to think of what would be a spoiler. Yeah. So how would you, who would you recommend these books to? Obviously, anyone that's watching this video has probably read them or isn't planning to read them one way or another because spoilers. But who do you think this series would be? Like, who would like this series? Funnily enough, I think whoever liked Name of the Wind would also like this. Really? I would yes. not have thought of that at all. I think that it has beautiful language in a very different way. The story is completely different, but to me, there's a lot of the same uh, vibe to it in a different way. So I think that someone, not everyone that liked The Name of the Wind, but I think a lot of people that liked Name of the Wind would. And then I think people that are more into sci-fi ideas than uh, necessarily connecting deeply with characters because all of this it's it's more idea based than anything else. Yeah, that's probably what I was going to say. I feel like this isn't really sciencey science fiction. At least I didn't think so. Right? Like right. I don't feel like you get a lot of actual science thrown at you. But it is very. I feel like this is a very good contemporary version of the science fiction of the past that was a lot more idea and concept based, like kind of a what if from a kind of philosophical perspective, um, but it's not just all men and it's not incredibly misogynistic. So yeah, do you want to do an outro? I feel like yours are better than mine. I could have <laughs> you do them for every video. Thank you everyone for watching and I hope to see you next time. That really was a bad outro. Oh well. Bye. <laughs>